Okay, well, welcome to this session on a panel on recognizing and sustaining process control value. I'm one of the moderators, John Hedengren at Brigham Young University, and uh, we have Mark Darby as well from CMID Solutions. And I'll turn it over to you, Mark, for some of the introductions. Okay, so um, welcome all. This is, I guess you would call it a repeat performance of the same panel from the AICHE spring meeting that we held uh, virtually in, in August of this year. So we'll uh, start off with just some introductory and uh, uh, remarks, panel introductions. The panel will then each have roughly five minutes to um, prevent, uh, present several slides. And, um, and then after that, we'll uh, proceed into the, to the panel discussion with the, with the Q&A. So process control has proven its value in numerous applications, namely through increasing profit, bringing about safer operation and leading to more productive staff. A key point is that advanced process control is revenue generating with the beneficial attributes of low capex, quicker payout compared to many other alternatives and yielding significant benefits, often ranging from hundreds of thousands of dollars to over a million dollars per year, depending on the scope and the application. Um, unfortunately, the success rate across the process industries is a bit uneven with some companies struggling with, with process control initiatives. Uh, other challenges that impact companies to varying degrees uh, concerns loss of control staff, retirements, um, getting management support, and wrestling what to do with new technologies. So our group today, our panel today, uh, is an impressive group uh, representing plant sites, central groups, and headquarters. Um, all of, all of whom have worked the majority of their careers in process control. So they have firsthand experience applying advanced control technologies, getting management buy-in, as well as training and mentoring activities. So let's uh, meet the panelists. And John, I'll let you take this part while I advance the slides. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate that. And, and just to introduce Mark as well, he has uh, served on, uh, you know, at Aspetech, he was a, he was a vice president. There's, uh, he worked at a number of other companies as a leader in process control and uh, advanced process control and now has a consulting business. He got his PhD at the University of Houston. I'll, I'll go on to uh, Brian Ashcraft. He's advanced control expert at Dow and he champions advanced control applications and in support for Dow initiatives, coordinates projects with businesses and is part of uh, the global uh, manufacturing initiatives. Um, he got a, a chemical engineering and computer science degree from Texas Tech University. All right, and on to the next one. Uh, Mark, if you want to share. Yes, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Okay, Don Bartusiak. Uh, he recently had uh, retired from ExxonMobil and now um, is working at a startup company uh, to further some of the initiatives that he has been doing with open process automation and others. Um, he has uh, master's and PhD degrees from Lehigh University and he served as the National Director of Computing and Systems Technology Division, the CAST Division uh, for AICHE. And he's been program chair on many initiatives as well. Uh, he's he, um, also an executive board member at ISA, uh, managing director of ISA Standards and Practices Board and a number of other, of other initiatives. He received the Computing Practice Award from AICHE CAST Division in 2011 and was inducted into the Control Engineers Hall Automatic Automation Hall of Fame in 2015, and has uh, a number of other awards uh, that are in the, in the bio that we'll post afterwards as well. So welcome, Don, as well. All right, next up is, is Ray. Um, he is at Marathon Petroleum 
in uh, the Galveston Bay Refinery as Advanced Process Control Supervisor. And he, um, he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. And he is a professional engineer and a project management professional. All right, on to Greg. All right, Greg is a retired senior fellow from Solution Monsanto and ISA fellow. Uh, he uh, has written a lot on different process control and automation subjects. Uh, he was an adjunct professor at Washington University St. Louis uh, up until 2004. And uh, he continues a number of initiatives. Uh, many of you have probably seen some of his things, uh, his, his uh, articles that he's written. We certainly appreciated his perspective that he's given as he's um, uh, to the industry. All right, and uh, Sebastian. Sebastian is an APC specialist at Total Petrochemicals at Port Arthur Refinery in Texas. And he um, obtained his degrees from Engineering École Central de Marseille. And he spent over 10 years with BP, uh, mainly in advanced control. And he joined Total in 2012 as an APC consultant and um, he's been deploying APC projects for over 20 years. So you can see from these panelists, we have a great group uh, and a number of perspectives that are unique uh, and, and also uh, give a perspective, especially for a younger generation of engineers who are just starting, may wanna have some perspective on how to get started or where are the opportunities uh, in these fields. Okay, very good. Well, um, now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our panelists for just brief, um, just to get things going, uh, some brief discussions. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start it in the order that we introduced. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. And uh, as, as I mentioned, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So we'll, we'll present um, some slides. Um, here and then if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat window. Uh, we'll save the unmuting of the microphones until we go to the full panel uh, discussion part. But if you have questions along the way, uh, feel free to uh, ask the questions now and we'll just kind of keep those in reserve. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Brian and I'll just present your slides, Brian here, just so we reduce the transition time. Sure. Um, and, um, you can go ahead and flip to the second one. All right. There you go. <laughs> it, it's just a recap of what uh, was already discussed. I've spent my whole career with Dow, even though I've probably worked for four companies now. And all because of mergers and acquisitions and renames and rebranding. Um, as mentioned, I'm the um, expertise area leader for advanced control. And I'm in the central engineering group. And my whole career has spent in the central engineering group. And it's been, it's given me quite the perspective as I've traveled, you know, the globe to see all of Dow's sites and uh, get exposure to all of Dow's different businesses as we, you know, implement these fun control projects. And uh, as a fun tidbit there, I had the last bullet that vanilla is my favorite flavor of ice cream, particularly French vanilla. I like the extra egginess in it, so. And if you need to or want to contact me later, it's my email address at the bottom of the slide. You can go to the next slide, please. So Dow as a company has these uh, listed as our ambition and values as opposed to a, a flat mission statement. You know, going out and being, having integrity and respecting for people on the planet and safety is always our number one priority. And things that I like about Dow with respect to the respect and to the integrity and safety is that we always adopt the more stringent rules between Dow's policy or the country's policies where we are doing business. So if you'd like to learn more about Dow, I have a couple links down there, uh, particularly if you're interested in looking for a job with Dow. There's the link to the page directly to the list where you can peruse the, the jobs by location. So the next slide, please. 
this is always a fun slide I like to see from various companies when they do presentations at, uh, at conferences is where do you have plants and, and facilities? So again, this is from the Dow website and every one of those markers is a, is a Dow facility for uh, either doing natural gas processing or for uh, you know actual chemical processing to regional sales offices to R&D facilities. So you can see there's a local office near you unless you're in the extreme northeast of, of Russia. Okay, so next slide, please. So as part of a lead in to what we're talking about today, I, I kind of sat down and said, what does is, what is process control mean inside of Dow? And to people that aren't necessarily privy to these subjects, these are all of the things that process automation and control folks do in Dow. And I, you know, I first started writing this list and then went out to our internal website and made sure I didn't miss something silly. So I think I've got most everything that's a major topic. So you can see there's a quite a wide variety of topics that when you just say, I do process control, when you're talking to somebody that actually does process control, you have to be a little more specific because there's experts in each of these things. And to be a generalist and at least understand what goes into these takes in a lot of effort as it is. You can see there's a lot of fun things and I only participate in probably three or four of these to any kind of effect within Dow. So everything from the instrumentation that includes your control system up to the MES system, which is your historian and maybe your supervisory control system, up through your advanced control and optimization systems is roped into what we consider process automation in Dow. So thank you, John. And you're muted, John, just in case. Okay, very good. Thank you, Brian. Uh, really good. Uh, we are going to go on now to, uh, let me go on to Don as the next, um, next one. Oh, I've got a PDF here. So let's see, I'm trying to think about how to. I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, go ahead, Don. That's great. Hello, everyone. Uh, pleased to be here. Yeah, so I want to uh, basically build on some points that Mark made in his introduction. So uh, I, I, my first chart is about addressing the economic value of process control. So, you know, if you're working in industry, whether you're in an operating company or a, you know, a, a technology company providing services or, or, or technology to the operating companies, it, it really is about generating economic value, either for your company or for your customer. Um, but, but let me, the, the, the measures of whether or not you're succeeding at creating economic value, I, I want to address those four bullets at the bottom of the chart first. So th this is how you know that you're making a difference. Uh, the, the thing I call hard economic credits would be things like increasing production of products. So that's going to increase your revenue, uh, you know, the more product that you can sell. Uh, or another uh, realization of a hard economic credit is in, in reducing your operating expenses. And you do that either by um, you know, reducing the, the cost of the raw materials to, to, to create per unit of product um, or, or the, the elimination or reduction of, of any type of manufacturing losses. And that's, that's how we contribute economic value with control. Um, then there, there are softer measures of, of value contribution, like process stability and reliability, where um, you basically, uh, you know, keep keep the process running in a stable in a stable way. And I'll give you a specific example, uh, like with fired heater combustion control. Uh, it, it sounds kind of simple, you know, how do you control a, a boiler or a fired heater? You want to basically maintain a desired level of excess oxygen and the minimum amount of combustibles coming out of the stack. But you can get into process safety situations caused by control problems where you can actually blow up a boiler, create explosions, kill people uh, just by not doing combustion control properly. So that's a stability, reliability, safety contribution that we make with control. 
the third the third area I want to talk about is you know your customer. If you're working out an industry, your primary customer is going to be the console operator. You know the individuals, the men and women who actually run the units. You, you can think of it. There's the they're the pilots of the planes, and you can make yourself a hero. Um, and by, by making their lives easier by automating what they do. And, and, and that's a big, that's a, it's a very gratifying way that we contribute value. And the last, the last area of contribution is since we're on, always on the front line of acquiring data and making that data available and useful to others in the organization, we often contribute by helping others identify opportunities to optimize uh, optimize a unit, um, eliminate constraints, or uh, as a basis for continuous improvement. So, so they're the measures of how we deliver economic value. The table above, and there's, there's too many words for me to verbalize in five minutes, but the column one is a kind of a progression up a ladder of how we deliver value. And then the column two the, on the right is the technologies that we use to, to realize those value mechanisms. So it all starts with just monitoring. So that's understanding the state of the unit. So, you know, we contribute by, you know, the installation, the use of sensing devices, instruments and analyzers, uh, final control elements like valves, motors, pumps, et cetera. It monitoring, we also, we in control contribute models that enable us to estimate states of a system that aren't directly measured. So that's, we use those terms, inferentials and state estimation. So running the unit where you want it, that's what regulatory control is all about. It's rejecting disturbances. Climbing up that ladder is running the unit where it's most profitable. And that's where model, the more sophisticated technologies like model predictive control and real-time optimization are used. Um, transitioning the units among operating points is, is where we get into sequential types of control, logic-based controls, or more sophisticated MPC approaches like nonlinear, nonlinear model predictive control. The, the new areas for our, our frontier areas for contribution are more explicit contributions to reliability. So um, asset management, this is probably not something you get taught in school. Uh, basically all of the instrumentation that we use these days uh, has a, a diagnostic data in the electronics that are on those devices and how we use that data to increase reliability is another measure of economic performance. And some of the frontier areas for, uh, for us are like data-driven or machine learning approaches for predictive maintenance um, and, and even higher levels of contribution, uh, economic, uh, like RTO that is explicitly aware of the state of equipment. These are new frontier areas for us. And then reducing human error um, it is, is where you're, you'll hear a lot of buzz in industry right now about autonomous operations. And, and so, so that's where you're going to see, again, a further contribution of machine learning and autonomous systems technology to further achieve a higher level of automation. So, John, if you can go to the next slide, please. So there, there's a lot of information on this chart, and, and it's kind of in code. So let me Don, you got muted. If you, uh... sorry. Yep. Thank you. Um, th think that think of the x-axis as you, your time in career. So you know you'll start you know start just uh, basically doing like PID control type of stuff when you get started. But w when you get to the right hand side, you're doing more sophisticated skill uh, tasks. So think of the x-axis as time or career stage, and the 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 legend there, the black color is meant to uh, indicate in my mind what the core competencies of a control application uh, engineer would be. The green is, is uh, intended to indicate uh, essential supporting technologies that you might not be taught about in, in chemical engineering school. Um, Gray would be the like extensions off of the mainstream uh, of the mainstream core competencies, and, and blue is meant to indicate the frontier areas. 
So just uh, I'll just walk through the the main the mainstream core competencies. So when you get started as a control applications engineer, that's where you'll take advantage of the things you've learned in school. Und understanding dynamics, uh, that's something that's unique to us. Most of the engineer, most chemical engineers, they're pretty good at modeling, uh, but it's all about steady state. And when you start getting into dynamics, that's something that differentiates the control people. And, and the whole concept of feedback and stability of closed loop systems. So that's, that, that's really where you get started. Um, but, but after, you know, after maybe an initial period of learning uh, where you're basically maintaining control strategies designed by others, then you're gonna start designing your own control strategies. So that's that control strategy design. You'll step up from there into uh, model predictive, doing model predictive control applications, doing model-based uh, estimators, possibly getting into nonlinear control. Um, Real-time optimization is a kind of an adjacent area. A lot of our controls people go into real-time optimization. Um, and then finally, the finally, the, maybe the top edge where you'll get into algorithm development, advanced programming and the like. So that, and underpinning all that foundation is your ability to work with others, your ability to understand the business and your ability to communicate. So. So just I, 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 in the interest of time, I'll leave the rest of this chart uh, alone without verbalizing it. And I just want to close with two points uh, on the right. And it's basically bullet number three and bullet number four. Um, and this touches on things that Mark and, and John said in the beginning. The, the, the context, if you go to work for an operating company as a control engineer, you, you really do need to understand that the, the operating company's mainstream is going to be on process and products, right? And, and what we do is, is, you know, going to be perceived as it's an engineering specialty in, in the team, if you will. But the mega trend that's going on in industry right now is all operating companies are trying to basically become more digital, use data more, 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 more intelligently. And that's a real opportunity for us. So that, that's another area for, for growth uh, in, in your control career. And the, the last point that I want to make is, uh, you know, I, I think we're really at a transition in our technology set in control. And we're going to need to move to more innovation friendly systems to allow us to increase our, our, our economic contributions. And the, the concept that John mentioned in introducing me, open process automation is an industry initiative to transform our tool set away from closed proprietary vendor products, vendor systems towards a standards-based open and interoperable architecture that basically opens the door up to more rapid innovation uh, for example, the, the company that I'm currently running, Collaborative Systems Integration. So I, I hope we get some questions along those lines. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for me, John. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Don. We're going to go over to Greg now for his. And these are great questions that are coming through the chat window. We have a number of discussions going back and forth there already. So thank you for that. Keep those going. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, share Greg's slide. So go ahead, Greg. Greg, I think you might be muted right now. Um, I started two. out in instrumentation design and construction in the first eight years. I spent a lot of time in the plants, and that was very good. But back, back then, the installed accuracy of the measurements was really about uh, 10 times worse than what was stated in the catalog. And now with uh, these smart instruments being able to compensate for uh, operating conditions and installation conditions, we are achieving what the catalog accuracy stated it could be, uh, which is about an order of magnitude better than was uh, previously the installed accuracy uh, uh, when I got started and for many, many years. Um, now, control valves also, that, which provide the means of affecting the process, have much more sensitive, uh, higher pressure diaphragm actuators and smart flexible positioners. 
Uh, diaphragm actuators are about 10 times more sensitive than piston actuators, but for very big valves and for high pressure drops, you uh, we were limited uh, and uh, to the fact the diaphragm pressure maybe was only uh, 30 PSI. Uh, and so uh, now with 90 PSI diaphragm actuators, you can uh, use these more sensitive actuators to get much more precise control. Uh, the PID controllers today offer a much more capability, both in terms of adaptive tuning, um, but uh, also through uh, external reset feedback, something that uh, Shinsky and I have both written uh, a lot about. You can do batch profile control, controlling the slope, and do endpoint control, and also continuous composition control using analyzers. And uh, you don't have to be uh, concerned uh, as much about the, uh, the cycle time causing tuning problems. In fact, at some point, uh, uh, there is no tuning problems. And it's all due to uh, flipping a switch uh, for external reset feedback. So there's a lot of uh, PID capability that is actually untapped and offer an opportunity for uh, somebody with an innovative orientation. And now we know that PID tuning can be much better for uh, temperature and composition control if we realize that the lag dominant processes are really uh, should be treated as near integrating and use integrating tuning rules. And uh, when I started out <clears throat> and transferred into engineering technology, uh, we had to actually write our own dynamic simulations and Fortran code and, uh, and, and advanced control simulation language. Um, the steady state simulations were very much far along and actually uh, at Monsanto that was then given to Aspen Research and that became Aspen Tech's uh, steady state simulation. So I was in engineering technology where simulation both steady state and dynamic was a, a core part of our, our thinking. Now with digital twin simulations, uh, we don't have to write those, uh, those models in code. We can use first pr principle modeling objects and automation blocks that, uh, that simulate uh, the dynamics of automation systems, the valves and the measurements. And uh, at Monsanto and Solutia, we demonstrated that we could decrease uh, the cost of goods by process control improvement by 2%. And it was interesting, the improvement in batch cycle time was very remarkable, was, was greater than 20%, principally because a lot of the batch operations are sequential and didn't take a can, uh, advantage of fed batch and override control and now uh, future value prediction and batch profile control. Um, however, to really get the recognition you need to spur more innovation and get more time allocated to do this, innovation, you really need the monthly KPI metrics that show the benefits for process efficiency and capacity in dollars. And it's important to do it for uh, on a monthly basis because that's what accounting and that's what management very much tuned into accounting is gonna be looking at. In fact, Peter Martin has written several editions of a book about real-time accounting and how important that is in terms of it being on a monthly basis. So I can go to the next slide. And so this is the methodology we used at Monsanto and Solutia. We, we had a guy who was very much into counting, even though he was a great process control engineer. So he would look at the plant cost sheets and come up with the average KPI and the best performance you could see in terms of best KPI for the actual plant. And then uh, we, uh, we documented that, but then we also looked at business plans as we moved to the right here on this block diagram in terms of current and future requirements. And then we looked also at research reports, technical studies, and did simulation now with the digital twin and online metrics, providing us an idea of what the potential best KPI is. We then, uh, thinking through the plant KPI demonstrated and what we see we think we can do, we came up with a KPI target and, uh, um, and compared that to the actual, got a KPI gap, selling dollar amounts, and uh, came up with a motivation. Then we looked at what was the time requirements and toss, cost requirements to actually address that gap. Next slide. <clears throat> Here it shows that now with the digital twin, boy, we used to have to write code actually for a PID controller or any sort of dynamics. Now 
we actually import the control system, displays, alarms, historium, and all the tools directly. So there's, a, you know, there's no emulation or running on code. We, we actually have what's being used or going to be used in the plant. And then instead of having to write code for the dynamic simulation, we have uh, objects, advanced modeling objects for most unit operations, and then blocks to simulate the dynamics, final control elements, measurements, and for future value prediction and other advanced capability. So the digital twin offers improvements in exploring and discovering, and notice these arrows go back and forth. So you go back and forth, prototyping, testing, justifying, deploying, testing, training, commissioning, maintaining, troubleshooting, auditing, and then getting operator system and process performance. And notice the operator part there is very important. Showing the before and after benefits of solutions from online metrics. Uh, next slide. And so there's also an ISA mentor program and we now have over 35 protégés and 15 resources. And there's some uh, uh, things here uh, that you can, uh, links that you can go to. And we encourage you if you have uh, if you have a job and you're working in as a practitioner and you want to uh, learn more about process control and automation to participate in this. Next slide. And finally, uh, I've written a lot of books, but uh, just uh, last year I finished this book with uh, Hunter Vegas, the uh, the co-leader of the mentor program, and it was really inspired by that mentor program. And we got fifty. Uh, uh, experts from the process industry, including Mark Darby, uh, to write uh, on their, uh, you know, their expertise. And what's really neat about this, it's very concise and focused on getting the best performance, including uh, best practices at the end of each uh, subsection. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Greg. All right, we're going to have uh, Ray go next. And we want to have plenty of time for uh, Q and A, and so we'll. Um, I've asked Ray and Seb to summarize some of their comments, and and then uh, we will uh, go into the Q and A. But thank you so much for putting those questions in the chat window as well. That gets us started. All right, Ray, go ahead. Hey, I'm Ray Coker. I, I lead the APC group at the Galveston Bay Refinery in Texas City. Uh, let's go to the next slide if we could. I realize the audience is, is uh, a very wide uh, age of people, but I wanted to highlight some of the things we do uh, talk about in terms of uh, control. So one of the things I want to highlight is uh, the measure what we want to improve. I know Greg mentioned uh, monthly KPIs and, and we, we value that very highly. Uh, we also want to make sure our, our short-term, long-term goals are consistent with refinery needs. And most important, we want to start with the end in mind. We want to make sure that whatever we come up with, whatever projects we decide to have value and are justified, we want to make sure we have enough people at the end of those projects to support them, make sure we can continue to improve things. Next slide. So some of the things we measure are KPIs for control and inferential calcs. And I'll show a couple, one example on the next slide. Uh, we focus really on, on the uh, active constraint sets. So on, on this case, we're looking at actual to, to potential benefits against MVC performance. MVC performance weighs each, each MV equally. So basically it's a fair way of comparing our engineers against each other and our other locations against each other. The actual and potential are based on actual benefits achieved. And, and for me, that's what drives the projects, that's what drives the manpower. Uh, we're always looking at cost to benefit ratios on projects to make sure we have the right mix of projects each year. And from 2016 to 2019, uh, we increased at a rate of 24% per year with new applications. Uh, market played a little bit of a part in that, but it didn't help us at all this year, I have to say. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's already talked about benefit to cost. So hiring and development plans. So I've, I've enjoyed working with interns that have anywhere from one year to three years experience. And they've all been very productive in, in doing APC related work. Uh, so we do uh, within our, our refinery, we do a lot of internships and we also do a lot of hiring of young engineers. So 
uh, in, the, in the APC world, there's, there's 76 uh, competencies that I look for in developing a new engineer in the APC field. And uh, as we get a new person in, we try to focus on the things where they can deliver the most value. Uh, getting alignment with management, uh, product management, as well as uh, area teams. We'll make sure that we have good, good support of, of the projects we're doing. And we'll make sure that the parties that we set are in, in line with the, the needs of the uh, area teams as well. Uh, we have delayed some projects due to economics. Uh, support time. Uh, it's really a function of project cost and also the margins on the unit. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. I bring this up because when I when I started here in, in 2010, this is the model I, I created for them. This is how much benefit we could create with one engineer, two engineers, three engineers, and four engineers. Now we've we've exceeded this model now now that we're 10 years into it, and we've exceeded all of our expectations. But we pretty much followed this trajectory initially until we kind of hit what, what, what I envisioned uh, 10 years ago, what we could create in terms of value. Uh, we we've, we've cer certainly surpassed that as we come up with new ideas or other people, uh, our stakeholders come up with new ideas. So it's, it's very important that we collaborate with all the people that we're working with. It's so important. So I'm gonna leave that uh, back to you, John. Okay, very good. Thank you, Ray. All right. And uh, for our last, uh, we have Sebastian. So Sebastian uh, mentioned, I'll just go to his last slide here. Well, the sorry. second one, if you can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, third one. Sorry. Third one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Th this, uh, this is an example in order to try quantifying the, what the previous uh, people have been talking about for a, a single oil refinery in Texas. We're talking about multiple process units being uh, assembled and working together uh, in, inside a single site. And for each of these units, we can think of applying uh, advanced process control with some of the principles that uh, Ray and other people talked about in terms of prioritization uh, from, let's say, uh, uh, essentially benefits point of view. And you can see here uh, some ratios of the cost and benefits uh, as uh, Mark Darby illustrated also a very quick payback. And just as, a, as an indication here for this single refinery, we're, we're talking about uh, $15 million per year benefits of uh, having deployed advanced process control uh, over the course of uh, 10 years or so. All right. Next slide. So what are the, the challenges and opportunities in terms of uh, running an, an advanced process control business, if you want, at a refinery? The first thing is about training. How do we get uh, people on back into advanced process control, right? So my experience tells me that uh, I'd rather hire uh, a chemical engineer with three years experience in process support. Now, where are, where are these people? Uh, in the area where I'm working in Texas, we, we really struggle to find uh, people and uh, uh, junior engineers who want to join us. Um, so maybe that's a, a trend that some others are facing. And generally, the, during the first couple of years, uh, we, we provide a lot of on-job training and a senior uh, advanced process control engineer is going to dedicate about 25% of his time uh, training. Now, just to further illustrate the, you know, the cost benefits of, uh, of an APC program at a single site. Generally, we, I mean, in the past 10 years, we've used about $300,000 a year investment money to, to, to get going with our program. And sometimes in, the, in rare cases, when we really have very large unusual projects, we, we may require additional funding, but uh, generally, 300,000 a year is a, is a, is a reasonable uh, budget to get going. And that's not too much in, a, in our industry. So uh, that's the low, the low payback times. Uh, even with no budget, as long as you have a, a team of people that you train, you can execute projects in-house and uh, just uh, use your internal hours. Um, in our company, Total, which is a European-based company, the advanced process control is recognized like many other fields of operation 
as, as a metier, as a technical field. And uh, the role is subject to a specialist ladder. This means that when you want to grow uh, as, a, as an individual in the company, you are not forced to automatically select the management ladder, if you want, or the management uh, route. You can decide to remain technical and, uh, and become intermediate and then senior engineer and so on and so on, such that at the top of the ladder, uh, you the, the role uh, I mean the the equivalent uh, role of uh, a specialist of the last level in APC in total is an equivalent of a, a site manager for a small site. Um, and last thing I would say is that when there is no perspective for projects uh, at the site, people tend to leave. So that's why we we always want them always want to keep them busy and with new projects every year. Back to you, John. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Sebastian. That was excellent. I'm gonna uh, turn it over now to Mark to moderate some of our questions. We've had a number of them that have come in through the chat window and some excellent discussions have been going back and forth there. Um, and I'll turn it over to you now, Mark. Okay, I just wanted to put up a slide to mention some possible topics that uh, that you guys um, <clears throat> and ladies might have. Um, I think I saw some of the first questions come out concerning uh, displacement of operators with these advanced controls. Um, let's see. Brian, I think you were addressing that one. Maybe ex expand on that just a bit for the group. I think a couple of us did, but okay. I can repeat, maybe elaborate a little more. That that question comes up every time we talk about, you know, the these applications take away a lot of the work that the operators are doing when the plant is running normal. Uh, at, le at least from the MPC perspective, right? So. When the plant is running semi-normal, the plant, the, these applications tweak the plant to try to push efficiency in production. That's the one sentence version that we tell management that's what it's going to do. And then the operator representative in the room says, well, you're taking away everything that the operator is doing right now. Which the rebuttal is typically, no, we're taking away these things and letting you do these other things. So it's, it's, it's instead of making their job reactive, it's making it more proactive. So instead of having to adjust the feed flow and then the temperature and then this next feed flow and then the next temperature all the way down the line through time as they're trying to change rates, instead, they have the opportunity to impact the production by saying, okay, I need my rate here in order to achieve our production plan. And I know that uh, the composition over here needs to change so I can change that. And they have the opportunity to take a step back and use their intimate knowledge of how the process works to help optimize the plant as a whole instead of being reactive to alarms and the need to do things maybe for production or upsets. Okay. I see some questions that touched on um, I guess justifying and, and finding uh, opportunities uh, in the plant and, and going about and formulating and executing a project. Um, Ray, you wanna comment on how, how you do that at, at your site? Uh, yeah, I'd be glad to Mark, thank you. So from the time I was here, so last 10 years, I, I searched out the product control people that work with the LP, both the people that are running the LP as well as the ones that are developing the LP. And what I discovered was, okay, first of all, the level of detail is much different than the, in the DMC world. So there's a little bit of apples and bananas there, but you can find out that they, their understanding of process is pretty good and overall material balance is, is spot on. Uh, they may leave out some of the details within the unit, but it's important understand kind of the shadow prices that come out of there. Do, are, do they really have meaning? Do they really tell you something about 
how when you we ship a product from one to the other, are you getting the true value or not? So, uh, and if you if you are, then it could help you and guide you in terms of how you should set up your your uh, your objectives within the DMC controller. So we we welcome their information and we use their information every month. We use their their prices to update our uh, potential benefits, and then we use our constraint sets to calculate uh, actual benefits. And we're currently involved in a kind of multi-unit optimization that heavily involves products control. So uh, making sure we understand their targets and their constraints are both critical to our success. Okay, great. Um, you know, the topic of getting buy-in from management's come up in some of the slides a couple times. Um, I, th I think a, a good question would be, you know, what can the individual uh, engineer do? You know, what's, uh, what can that person do to, to get that, uh, that attention and, and focus on process control? Um, Seb, I think I'll throw that one to you. Sure. So the, I make a, a big difference whether or not a first application does exist at, at a site, right? If there is no no um, knowledge or no experience, prior experience at a given site about advanced process control, the, the answer will be different. But you know, advanced process control was uh, is a technology that really started in the 80s, right? Uh, so one could think that it's now su sufficiently spread out in most of the uh, refining and, and, and petrochemicals. But of course, there are other industries where it's different. But I'll talk about my industry, mostly refining, where advanced process control has been around for, for over 20 years. In that case, what we do is that we have what we call area meetings in the refinery, where uh, units are grouped by geographical and uh, affinities if you want and then by by getting people to meet every day and talk about maintenance issues operation issues process process issues uh, financial issues on the unit then we really open a forum for engineers and operators to talk about how to improve uh, on a continuous basis and then uh, by having the apc engineers participating into these forums then that gives us ideas for uh, let's say put together a, a, a project. Of course, um, we need to move that project uh, from an idea to, uh, to a justification. And that's where uh, Ray, Ray's comment about working with a department that is called planning and economics is critical because you need to translate an increase in rate or an increase in yield, for example, from a process unit into dollars. And that's where the justification comes. Um, then of course you rank your different ideas and then you look at the look for a budget but that's that's how a typical cycle works okay hey john i haven't been paying attention as that closely to the chat window are you seeing some other questions that you can summarize yeah a lot of a lot of good questions um you know just how do you how do you kind of tackle that bridge between engineers and operators? So a lot of good discussion about that, you know, overcoming the gap, um, getting, you know, and so a lot of great, I liked, uh, you know, Don's answer there, donuts and pizza, you know, just uh, get to know them, maybe go out to lunch with them, get comfortable with them, get rid of the us versus them mindset. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of great uh, uh, comments. Also um, a really insightful one from Ray, you know, listen before you speak, um, you know, really try to understand where they're coming from. So I, I appreciated that. Is there, are there any other uh, thoughts about that theme, about um, really be able to overcome that bridge? Um, so I'd maybe open that up to the panelists as well. This is Brian, a, a couple other words that have been noted over the years by other control engineers is that, uh, you know, the operators are there for their whole career. Right, they, they intern there, they start working there as outside operators, maybe they come inside to be panel operators. They are there, they know the plant, they know everything, and they know they can outweigh you. 
So if you come in and you ask them and you, you start telling them and dictating things and saying, you know, this really should be done this way. And they come back and say, no, your predecessor three times before tried that and we're not trying that again. They're not going to tell you why it failed. They're not going to work with you. It's all about being on the same team and building that team mentality with the operators. Most control engineers don't stay in their block for more than three or five years, at least at Dow. And that's, it's, a, it's an endemic problem that I've seen because you know, there's a perception that you don't have a career in control if you stay there your whole career, which can be argued as backwards to everybody that's on the panel today. <laughs> but when you, when you build that trusting relationship and you fix problems that they have, don't go in there and say, hey, you have a problem with this. I, this is how you fix it. No, you say, what problems do you have with how you run the plant and what can I do to help? It's all about how do you frame the question? How do you approach what they're doing, right? As they gain confidence in you, they'll start giving you real problems. They may throw you the hardest curveball ever to start with, knowing that there's no way you can fix it, but that's not typical. So I would, I would really push just to have the conversation, going in there and acting like you're one of the production engineers, right? Every morning, ask them how things ran, learn how the plant and what bugs them. You know, some, something swung last night and they don't know why and start looking at that kind of thing. So exactly, Sebastian, don't go in. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Dr. Osta and I'm here to help. That's probably not the right approach. So yeah, it's, it's all about being personable as much as, as much as we're all introverts and wanna be computer jockeys, you really wanna be personable and get really down to earth with these guys and gals that are working the boards. They're there day in and day out working way more hours than you ever will and just take the time to you know be among them sit in the control room while they're living through an upset and offer offer what you can see happening and ask if that helps any you know and then that kind of thing are you interpreting what's happening by what they're seeing through the instrumentation and, and whatnot in the control room all right okay. i'll get off my soapbox yeah, I, I'd like to add that uh, really, I think you can make them appreciate, you can elevate their role. And uh, if you listen to them, and particularly if during, a, if you have good dynamic simulations for training, and they ought to be done on a continuing basis and so they can work through different situations and you take the best of uh, their uh, suggestions and then uh, put them in uh, state-based uh, or procedure automation. And uh, I mean, we, we've learned to do that, you know, particularly for compressor control or, or some situations where they say, oh, there's no way you can automate this. It requires an operator. Well, that's really a key to being really a potentially great oper uh, opportunity by finding out what some of the better operators do and then working with them uh, and to show them now what part of the, Deal is though, if they have online metrics, they may not like that at first. And, and the online metrics can be based on shifts as well. What we find out is a lot of disruption occurs when we go from one shift to another, they start changing set points. Um, and they may not like uh, having online metrics showing what they're doing, but in the long run, they'll start to get, you know, their competitive spirit will kick in and they'll start to uh, understand the implications of some of their actions in terms of them making uh, manual output changes or set point changes. And, and if, they're, if these are legitimate, again, that ought to be part of state-based control or procedure automation uh, by uh, working with them. And I have to agree that some of the best uh, people in terms of implementing, um, say, model predictive control would spend uh, a lot of time in the control room before they even got started to make sure. And then same thing applies to, uh, for, for me, when I, I try and do state-based state control procedure automation, which has been very key for compressor surge control, ripper pH control, and, uh, uh, and reactor startups, and, and also for 
uh, uh, improving batch control. So, uh, you know, they're working and understanding with the operator and, 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 you know, with dynamic simulations, the neat thing is you can make mistakes and we learn the most from our mistakes. So you make a, make a lot of mistakes and find out really what's going on, uh, but not, uh, not, you know, key on, on criticizing uh, something being gone wrong, but uh, saying, what can we learn from these mistakes and, and make the most out of them? Okay, good. Yeah, if I can contribute maybe two points to the, to the question, I think point point number one. This is a, I guess a, a, a comment on something that Brian said. It, you know, it will depend, you know, company to company. But you know, my experience in Exxon Mobil is um, we we had a good mix of people. You know, rotational control engineers. People were like only in the job for a few years and then moved out. But we we Exxon Mobil has a a big, a big population of, you know, career long, you know, contributors in, into control. So it, it just depends on the, I guess, the norms of your operating company. And, and I see my colleague, Alan Pinders, you know, at least was on the call in the beginning. He's a, another example of that. So that, that's point number one. But point number two, in terms of being effective with the operators or the contact engineers, the process engineers, the business team, whatever you call it, Absolutely, everything the panelists said about listening first is is key, but it, it, you need to do more than that. You need to speak in the language of your customer, of the operator, uh, of the process engineer, of the business team. You know, they don't really care about your theories and, and the math and stuff like that. You need to explain what you're doing with your solutions in terms of the language that your customer is familiar with and what, 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 of the, what is their problem that you are solving? That, that's a real key to being effective personally. Okay. Hey, John, just wanted to do a time check. Um, how are we doing? Yeah, I mean, we're about uh, out of the typical hour time. I like the momentum that's going on right now. So um, if, Okay. If you need to go, I'd say go ahead and leave. Uh, but we'd like to go maybe about 15 minutes longer if that's possible. Okay. Perfect. Could um, I, could I, I add something? Oh, certainly, right. No, go. Uh, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, my experience working with operators one was a case where an operator was very upset uh, that we were even doing APC because he, he really he thought that. I was replacing him and obviously uh, wasn't true, but I, I, I did have to spend some time understanding his viewpoint and he had some, some valid points. And once we got through the end uh, and three hours later, probably I was, I, I think he was tired of talking when I was able to have a, a chance to really explain what I was there for uh, as one example. Um, the example is where I had a very experienced uh, chief engineer or not engineer, chief operator on the unit and, and he knew some things about the unit that wasn't obvious from the, from the P&IDs oh, and, and the data that I collected and so forth. And we actually were able to put in some critical constraints in, in the de design that only came about because of his specific knowledge on the unit. So there's two ways I, I think you need to think about it. And, and one is listening and the other is, is actually getting more information about the technical side that they have. Okay, good. I, I saw some questions come in related to some of the newer technologies, you know, the frontier technologies. Um, maybe the question might be, um, where might they find application? And let's see, there was another part to the question. Well, maybe that's it. Um, Don, this one may be for you to start off with, but you know, where might these applications be and how do you roll these, these, these new technologies out? Yeah, well, I, I, Mark, I, I guess I'll start my answer. I, I think we have, um, we've, we've achieved a high degree of sophistication and, and sustained success with you know, continuous processes and, and uh, the, you know, the real-time optimization of continuous processes. And so I think the, the, first front, the first new area, I would say, to extend our contributions is, is going to be on, you know, 
control control and optimization of transients. Um, you know, uh, you know, transitioning from state to state, grade to, grade to grade, if if that's the nature of the manufacturing process that you're you're controlling. Um, and then and then even harder problems would be like automating startups in particular. So so that would be one uh, area of of you know applications contributions that I still think there's pl plenty of opportunities and, and needs for tools that that you know aren't as as well reduced to practice as MPC um, and, and RTO are. Um, so I'll stop there just to just to have a, an understandable bite size answer. Okay. So I think at, at Dow, our approach is a, a little different order. There's a lot of facilities that won't let us come in until they've finished all the automatic startup and shutdown procedures for the plant. So once, once they have that working to the point where they don't need an engineer you know, tweaking it as they, you know, fine tune it. That's when, uh, that's when the APC folks are invited in. So um, I think I said this a couple panels ago, Mark, somebody from the audience had, you know, asked, how do you start up a gas turbine? And uh, having been worked in a power plant recently, I kind of knew how they did it. But then he countered with it, well, it should be one button. I said, well, right, it is one button, but this is the steps it goes through when it does it. And he was a little taken aback because that's, I mean, that's standard, at least for gas turbines. When they're ready to start it up, they, they hit the go button and it goes through all the appropriate checkpoints. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not operator interaction and double checking along the way. You know, once the once a, a piece of equipment gets to a certain state, those things are there's gates that say, okay, we think we're ready to advance programmatically. Do you agree? So there is a there is an opportunity to stop it, or, in, or at least approve it before it advances to the next startup, you know, step in the startup. So, I mean, even our ethylene plants are started up that way. So it's 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 a whole. I guess a whole different opportunity for automation that I guess Dow has really focused on over the past 30 years and uh, kind of neglected a few other points that we're trying to pick up expertise in again. But uh, yeah, it's that to me requires such intimate knowledge of your unit operations and the ability to actually organize yourself and think like a programmer. And so most people in automation and DAO that do the capital work and do that kind of programming are all chemical engineers being trained as computer programmers. I think in the past they tried to get computer programmers to come in, <laughs> but they, it was more difficult to train them as chemies than it was to train chemies as, as computer science people. Yeah, Brian, I agree with your comments, but I, I, but I, I do want to salute Dow. I think that I think Dow is exceptionally good at what you've described at automating you know, transient operations, and it goes back to the the philosophy that was in the mod system. Exactly. Um, but yeah. but I, I, I do I do believe that Dow is exceptionally good at that, and does not reflect the general state of the art in industry. Yeah. Well, I'll agree with you because yeah. I got spoiled, and then as we acquire units from other folks, right. right. I, I even try to lower my bar when I go in to do an evaluation for, you know, control improvements and I'm always disappointed. So, you know, it, it does get to be a little spoiling to have such an advanced amount of automation as far as getting, you know, cold equipment up to a run step where it's making some nominal 80% of production. So, yes, well, thank you very much for the compliment. Does anyone else want to speak to some new opportunity areas that that uh, you're either evaluating or that you think have uh, potential or promise? Maybe I can comment on uh, some of the uh, questions of, uh, related to machine learning. Um, as I said before, the technology, most of the technology we're working with is from the 80s. It has been 
improved along the years, but not through extremely significant uh, uh, changes, uh, at least for the technology that we're using at Total. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, we, we're looking seriously into machine learning and other types of uh, artificial intelligence to put in our control systems. And we're already starting. We have several applications where some of the virtual sensors that we try to combine with from instrumentation are, have been developed using uh, using non-traditional regression regressions, if you want, uh, like um, like artificial intelligence, machine learning. So, but uh, but like I commented in the chat, the biggest hurdle for us is to go closed loop. The the advanced process control has as this uh, specific. Uh, and unique uh, feature that we close the loop. That is every minute, our program is actually changing the pressure, temperature flows in the process unit. And we're talking here, all of us in this panel about process units, which are very dangerous. So get, getting closed loop means that you don't want somebody to think after 30 minutes that the system has diverge to an unstable and dangerous place that it should be turned off, right? You, you want to be certain that your system is working. And as soon as you introduce new techniques that you don't fully understand or that you cannot fully appreciate, then going closed loop is always going to be a challenge. That's, uh, that's what I have to say on machine learning. Well, Seb, do you think the opportunities therefore are greater, more in the diagnostic and prediction area? Um, then, you know, maybe some alternative form of closed loop control? Yeah, well, I mean, the, and this is where machine learning and artificial in intelligence is very strong, right? Uh, in predictive maintenance and monitoring. But if you think about it, if we make a parallel with the automotive industry, uh, artificial intelligence and closed loop control is, a, is going to be, or is currently being applied to automobile with, with uh, uh, with self uh, self driving cars, right? Uh, this is exactly our, uh, the, the problem I'm, I'm describing. When are we going to be comfortable enough that we we all going to be inside a self driving car? Okay. Um, does any other uh, of the panel have comments in this area? Okay. Um, maybe we end up talking about uh, um, career paths and, and, and maybe with the start of, uh, of what is, what's attractive to working as a process control engineer and, you know, what, what kind of what keeps you excited working in this uh, space? You know, we, we, we started off, uh, I remarked that, you know, the, the panel has, has essentially spent the, the most of their career in this area. Um, Maybe someone could comment on uh, why they continue to work in it. It's the ice cream in the control rooms. Is that vanilla? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really it's, um, at least in my role in particular, it's the constant learning. That's one big driver for me. Every time I start a new project, it's in a new facility. And even if it's a sister plant to producing something I've already done, there's always something different. Plus the site um, culture is always different as we go from facility to facility. So there's always something different to, uh, maybe politic isn't the right word, but you know something that you have to consider and tread lightly and make sure that you go through the whole process without ignoring things between getting agreement from operations, engineering, and leadership, that everybody's on board with what's about to happen to them. If they have any concerns, they need to talk it out, mm -hmm. right? So I'm a foreigner coming into these things every time. And if something goes wrong, it's always my fault. <laughs> so anyway, so the learning part is a big major driver just to get back to the question. The second bit is when you turn these applications on, either you just retune some loops and you want the operator to try to break it, or you, you redid a control scheme 
because it wasn't set up appropriately the first time, or you're turning on your MPC application and letting it go off and push to the corner of production, all of those things are extremely adrenaline driving. To watch it actually happen and get and get everybody to sit on their hands and just let it work. Yeah. That's the exciting part to this job, right? And you get almost immediate feedback on your loop, right? Of success or failure. I think that is what really drives me and, and gets me excited about coming to work every day is getting the getting to turn on part. Everything to get up to that spot is fun because of the learning and then you get the payoff when you turn it on and watch it work. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment? It's a, it's, it's a very dynamic world, literally and figuratively. I mean, you're the window <laughs> into the process, the means of affecting the process. Um, I don't know, of, I know a lot of process engineers that have moved into process control and that's good because they understand the process relationships. I don't know if too many that then decided, oh, uh, I want to go back into process design because this isn't exciting enough. Uh, they, they, they really like a process control. Some of them may move on to project management or upper management of some types, but they, I think they really uh, like the dynamic uh, world that, uh, that we're in and, and, the, and the fact that we, but we are really determining what's on a, on a moment to moment basis, what's going on. And we can make changes rather quickly that have rather uh, uh, dr dramatic effects. Whereas a process engineer may have to wait till he gets new equipment installed. Uh, we can put in a new uh, control system design strategy um, and, and do some uh, tuning and adjustment and, and make a pretty dramatic results. Okay. I think for me, Mark, it's what motivates me is is the economic drivers that are behind it all, right? So with each study I've done, I, I determine these benefit mechanisms, we design, and then we implement. And what I find is at the end of the day, it may not be the same set of benefits. It could have changed from the time we started to the end. But there, like like Brian said, there's so much to learn and so much to 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 take advantage of. And and I think the other piece that I like is innovation. Be able to come up with something that's never been done before is, is just thrilling for me to, to come up with a new, a new calculation and or a new inferential or a new way of implementing something that someone has never done before. And that's, that doesn't happen on every project, but it does happen quite often. And that's, that's pretty thrilling too. Mm. John, are we, uh, I guess we're at that time. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, this is an excellent panel discussion. Really appreciate all the perspectives. I think this is the most active chat window I think I've ever seen during one of these. So uh, thank you for all the, the feedback and, and for the panelists, not only for answering the questions here, but also for sharing their experience through the chat. Um, you know, just the collective experience with this panel. Um, I, I don't think we'd find a better group uh, than, than we've heard from today in terms of their perspective and experience and also sharing some of their uh, knowledge about the field and how to get started, what are the opportunities. It's a very exciting field and I hope you guys have all um, gained a, fl a flavor for that today. So with that, I'd also like to thank Mark for um, you know, hosting this and, and conducting the panel and, and for the panelists for, for doing that. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks everybody. And I, and I guess uh, John and I, maybe particularly John, would really be interested if, if there's uh, um, further interest in having more such panels and also if there's ideas or suggestions for, for topics. So um, send those to John. Very good. Well, thanks everybody. I'll stop the recording now.